and we will follow by my uh, good colleague and uh, even better friend, Paul Esmore from uh, Ryerson. So Paul is a sociology and communication professor at Ryerson. Uh, he, he is a past president of the FSAC, or he was the president of the Film Studies, Film Studies Association of Canada a few years ago. Uh, his research mainly involved uh, involved media history, film, newspapers, and um, more currently, more specifically, circuits of cinema and distribution before the Nickelodeon, so early cinema. First of all, thank you to Jean-Pierre and to Louis and to André, and especially to Francois Lemay, um, and to the Shirk and Laval and all of the funders. So it's really been the, the last four days, four days, one more day to go, um, it's really been, uh, in the best sense, um, like Miriam Hansen's uh, sense of a room for play and cinema as a room for play, and it's really felt like I've shared that room for play with all of you for the last several days. Um, oh. Do I have, okay. Um, I have been, um, looking at uh, traveling shows, and I'll show some maps uh, coming up, but for the materiality and for the collection this week, I decided to test the idea of just how much burden was it to pick up your show every day and move to the next location the next day. Um, so, and it's something that I've never really thought about before, I've never really researched it before, I have no sense of weight and cumbersomeness and how awkward it was to, uh, to break down your machine and put it back together and lift it. Um, and I hadn't really researched um, the labor of um, moving your itinerant show from place to place every day. So consider this example though um, from uh, my home uh, area of Newfoundland. I like to begin a lot of my essays with a little anecdote from Newfoundland. Um, uh, a choice collection went to the bottom in 30 fathoms of, wa of water were lost. Um, uh, last week in Burns Island, uh, I lost a trunk of films and 16 sets of illustrated songs to the deep water. Uh, this is a hard country to travel in in Newfoundland in the winter. Um, and it is near where the Harkins Company were stalled for over a week in ice and snow blockaded in a baggage car. Um, now, on the other hand, this tale of losing a trunk of films, losing a, a trunk of films and slides, um, is really nothing compared to these two horrific incidents, both happening to be from Texas. I think the journalists in Texas maybe were interested in the gory details. Um, a terrible accident, occur, uh, accident occurred at Cruz, resulting in the instantaneous death of Penny, a young man. His head exploded when the chemicals he was mixing in for his acetylene lights exploded, blowing off his head and injuring his partner. He was married only in January. Um, and again here, uh, in 1907, uh, the mutilated body of a traveling showman was found in a ditch, and they never found the murderers. Um, but he was, a um, hundred dollars of money that he was known to have had was stolen from him. So like, there are other dangers of traveling shows other than just the burden. Um, and of course, there are financial dangers and dangers that come from not paying your bills. Uh, so here's a couple of examples of um, people getting into trouble for um, uh, for not paying their bills and financial trouble and their machine getting confiscated by the person that they're owed their money to, which is often the, the uh, manager of the show that they're working for. And then the law gets involved in terms of who owns the machine and who owns the show. Um, and then in this um, case, uh, a show had um, borrowed a delivery van for the day that they were in town and the van escaped their control and everything was smashed. And so the end result is that they had to pay for the van but they got to keep the wreckage um, for what that's worth. Um, I am looking at really only one type of moving picture show. Um, I call them 
um, interstate booking circuits. So these are um, traveling shows, much like Lyman Howe, that uh, Charles Musser and Carol Nelson have written a full uh, book length uh, examination of. Uh, but much like Lyman Howe, there's um, a, a couple of hundred, maybe 200 uh, traveling shows throughout North America um, that travel among uh, regions and on wide regions. Um, there are, as anyone who's uh, studied early cinema knows, um, there are a wide variety of other types of cinema at the time, from uh, vaudeville chasers uh, to specialty acts in variety uh, traveling shows um, to summer parks. Um, but focusing on um, the interstate uh, long-range booking circuits, that is really where the variety uh, program of pictures and songs, of moving pictures and illustrated songs, that's really where that format uh, emerges from. So what becomes um, the Nickelodeon um, product um, comes from this longer range um, interstate circuit. So for example, here's a map of just 20 of the most prominent shows. Um, there are shows, uh, just to uh, say how important um, carriage and livery and the burden of work is, there are shows that do travel all the way from Victoria, British Columbia to Newfoundland and back again, um, and down into the Caribbean and South America, that, sh that same show actually. And um, in the United States, they tend to uh, stick to more regional circuits. Um, so only New England, only uh, New York and uh, Philadelphia, and um, uh, only one show, um, Archie Shepard, ever um, kind of colonizes the American South, and only a few shows do the entire West. Um, but the shows that do the entire West, they really do um, all the way from the Mississippi to the Pacific, and on a circuit that takes around two years for them to circle, uh, circle around through. Whereas the people like Lyman Howe who are working in New York and uh, Pennsylvania, they do uh, twice annual circuits of um, only four months and two months off. So that's just the bigger uh, context and the bigger picture. Um, for a little bit of theory, um, I was thinking of portability and knowing that Heidi would be keynote I, I've, for this um, work today, I've kind of moved from the idea of portability into um, not just even movement, um, but liquidity and thinking of uh, Bauman's idea of uh, liquid uh, modernity and liquidity as a series of opportunities um, that where, where we can think of mobility and portability as not just a spatial problem, but a temporal one. Um, so that you get that movement every day as a new opportunity every day, no matter how hard it is, no matter what the risk is, no matter how much money you've lost, um, tomorrow is always a new day. So that kind of what we would now call uh, a neoliberal um, um, approach to money making as opportunity is kind of there in the traveling show and in the idea of showmanship. In, um, and. Um, thinking of it in terms of this idea of a pointillist time, a pointillist time where every show, every event, every movement is a new opportunity and always a new risk, always a new risk at the same time. Um, the work I've done previously has focused especially on uh, the print material and the publicity and the advertising. So I'm, I'm gonna sh share uh, some of the work that I've looked at in terms of the uh, print material and the publicity. Um, the advance work for a show includes arranging for all of that printing, um, and it includes also arranging for the supplies of uh, disposable uh, fuel and gas and anything that needs to be renewed for every single show is arranged in advance and shipped independently in advance. So the shows that I've studied are not traveling with their own fuel and they're not traveling with their own advertising. 
um, their advertising and their fuel is is ordered from uh, a one supplier who ships it in advance. And then when they arrive in town, it's already there. Um, the show itself, uh, a picture show itself, um, includes um, at least a singer and a musician and an uh, electrician are operating the machine. And any one of those could be the manager. Um, only the piano is locally supplied. Um, everything else that travels with the show and travels with the show in trunks that are packed and shipped and carried. Um, and then the local work for the kinds of shows that I've, I'm studying, the local work is most often contracted with a ladies' aid society or a fraternal organization or a community group, and they manage um, the ticket sales and promotion. Um, and then, of course, when you move and arrange, you also have railroad crews, express and livery um, uh, agents, you have hotel agents and uh, meals that are arranged and newspapers uh, and advertising that's all arranged, bill posters that are hired and barkers that are hired. So there's a network of perhaps a hundred people um, that helps a show uh, happen every day and only five of those people are the traveling people. So here's an example of a local contract from Cook and Harris shows that a colleague of mine, Kathy Fuller, has been researching for uh, uh, 15 to 20 years. And I went back into the archives independently, thinking of collaborating with her. Um, for example, the local people, the local people, will do all of the bill posting and distributing and will advertise in all of the available newspapers. So but the advertising will be supplied in advance, but the promotion itself is part of what the Ladies' Aid Society or the church group is uh, required to do. Um, and so the bills and tickets, the advertising and the tickets, so the printed material is supplied um, in advance. Um, here's examples of the job printing, the printing that is arranged uh, centrally by the company. So Every single show, uh, one of the reasons that we know and that Kathy has known for a long time um, exactly what the rosters of all these shows are is that the bill, um, the bill uh, uh, posting and the job printing in particular um, notes exactly every show because it has to be arranged in advance. So for example, um, uh, three cents each for uh, making for each day uh, 10 to 25 window cards and dates that would be posted in the local stores. Um, three for a penny for three to 400 couriers. And the courier is like the program, um, and I'm gonna talk about that shortly, the program that would be given to each person in the audience. Um, and 10 for a cent for two to 300 two nights. And those are essentially uh, throwaways or, or giveaways. And the two nights are one-sided. The couriers are two-sided folder folded. And the window cards are poster size. Um, and they go in stores. Um, so here's some examples of a couple of two nights. Uh, again, these are one-sided, um, uh, uh, relatively small, just six by nine inches, uh, smaller than a, a piece of letter-sized paper. But there are also um, hangers that are almost two feet long. Um, and um, here's some examples of other two nights um, that was shared to me when I was at the Edit and Ar Edison archives from Dibble's famous shows. And what's interesting about this one is uh, Dibble's advance agent got uh, arrested for littering in, uh, at one point for uh, throwing these around the street, and they ended up on the street, so he got arrested for leaving them behind as litter. Um, and, of course, here's an example of a two-night from the LeMay co uh, collection. Those of you have, who were in the archive, it's on the wall in the archive. Um, the couriers, I said, are folded. So these have the date and the time imprinted. They have the program uh, described. They often have a picture of the show 
uh, the showman and something about what to expect. Um, they change only annually, but they, uh, they sometimes barely change annually. They'll have very little changes for years at a time. Um, so even as the films change, the, the couriers don't change that much. Um, and there are, because uh, Cook and Harris and because the Brinson collection um, and because we have a few others, um, they collected each other's competing material. Um, so we actually have a, a, a fairly wide range of um, maybe 10 or 12 different couriers from different companies, especially in upstate New York. Um, and so, for example, here's a set of Lyman Howe couriers that are in the Cook and Harris um, archives. Um, and um, what's interesting, um, thinking of um, what happens when the show arrives in town. Um, sorry. I am switching to talk uh, not about the advanced publicity, but to talk about the labor of putting on the show when you arrive in town. Looking a little more closely only the last couple of days, looking more closely at the contracts the last couple of days, um, for the work of um, hauling the material and hauling the trunks, um, the, com the 4th of July committee here uh, here's a, a Brenton Entertainment. Um, they agree to pay $50, and they will also pay for the transportation for themselves and the baggage from station to hotel and grounds and return and to secure good lodging and board for three persons at the rate of $1 a day. Now, this is a 4th of July show, um, and so the they got free room and board and transportation and um, hauling all the baggage included in the contract in addition to $50. But that's because this particular contract is for a, f uh, a 4th of July celebration. Um, the normal sharing contract details, um, the Mystic Iowa Opera House agrees to furnish the theater lighted, warmed, and cleaned, and with all its scenery and equipment, piano, ushers, prop, uh, property man, ticket seller, and doorkeeper, and the city license, and the usual advertising. But the show themselves agrees to furnish the full acting company, all lithographs, uh, bills, and dates, and bill posting, and they pay the, for the local transportation themselves. So the standard contract, the show pays for the transportation. And if you need extra labor, if you need uh, extra uh, help, to haul the heavy equipment, that comes out of your profit, that comes out of your take from the, um, from the box office. Again, uh, here's another contract. The show themselves pays for all transportation, express, freight, and baggage charges for their company. And that exact, um, that exact uh, language, Brinton took from Lyman Howe's sharing contract. Uh, which is in uh, the Brinton archives. Again, transportation express freight and baggage is paid for by the group itself. So there's an incentive to reduce the weight and to reduce um, the cost of having to pick up and move every day. Um, of all the things in the archives, in the Cook and Harris archives and the Brinton entertaining archives, it's interesting that Everything is included in that one sharing contract, room and board and advertising, all of it's included in that one sharing contract I'd shown before. But the baggage contract to hire the express company um, requires a second um, separate uh, print uh, and a, sep a separate contract. Um, so the baggage contract seems to be, I don't know exactly why, but um, the, the livery company, the, the uh, hauling company, who's actually going to carry the trunks of material from the train station to the hotel to the opera house, that's a separate contract that um, is arranged directly with the express company. Um, in the LeMay connect, uh, collection, uh, some of you have seen a few smaller pieces, but only smaller pieces, that have their original trunks. Um, so here is um, the Edison Rural, or sorry, the Pathé Rural. 
Okay, but in its original trunk with the original uh, stamp on the trunk, you can, uh, and it has a handle, and the handle still works very well. I didn't trust it though. Um, and also the um, Francois Sequa Le Nom, the. Okay, wait. Uh, the peacock. So the peacock projector that you had on display last night. Um, from 1890, so it is also in its original trunk, or at least in a trunk that's custom made for it. Um, and I've learned only the last couple of days thinking about it, I, um, it's something I've never really thought about before, um, that all of the projectors have custom made cases and trunks. Um, of course they do. Um, but I have no pictures of them. I've looked through catalogs. I've looked through the trade press. I see no pictures of the original trunks. Um, here's a 1903 Stereopticon. Um, I can't imagine how small it is. Uh, but it is a fantastic new Stereopticon. You can see the, the traveling showman there in the middle of the ad with carrying the Stereopticon in its case by a single handle, single-handedly. No freight express cartage or, ex or excess baggage bills. No disappointments owing to delays in transit or illuminating apparatus going astray. The weight is but 30 pounds, including the case. I, I can't imagine how this, uh, how, um, this stereopticon, whether it was quality or not. Um, because of the workshop this week, I went back to the New York Clipper, to the classifieds in the New York Clipper that I've been studying for around a year now. And indeed, there are many um, uh, examples of used uh, kinetoscopes and used projectoscopes being sold. And part of the um, a secondhand classified ad is that the case is included with the secondhand projector. Of course it is. Um, but it's something that I've read thousands of these in the last year in particular, and it's something I've never noticed before. I've always just focused on the equipment and the film. Uh, but when I went back and looked, a lot of them mention the case. Um, now, of course, it's not a surprise, and it's not even a particular burden uh, for your projector to fit in a trunk. Um, because all performers, and indeed all travelers at the time, traveled with a wardrobe trunk. And there was even a particular make of a tailor trunk um, that was especially well known as a theatrical uh, wardrobe and a theatrical trunk. Um, it's, it was the real um, high class trunk for American uh, uh, performers, the tailor trunk. Um, and. Um, here's a block of ads from the Clipper. Um, Schwartz trunks, Taylor trunks, Casey's trunks, um, Schwartz & Co. basement bargained um, trunks, Patterson trunks, and Central trunks. So uh, there are trunk companies uh, in particular that cater to uh, theatrical performers and uh, traveling acts, of course. Um, and indeed, when I went looking for it, um, there is a whole class of uh, professional trunk makers and trunk designers and trunk marketers. And they're not all Louis Vuitton, although Louis Vuitton sticks out as um, there was an ad that um, uh, everyone returns from U Europe with their Vuitton trunk, um, even at that time. Um, wardrobe trunks would have been, I don't know about the weight, but they would have been twice as large as a projector trunk. So a performer's, a vaudeville performer's wardrobe trunk, or a woman going back and forth to Paris on steamer, um, her wardrobe trunk, uh, or his wardrobe trunk, um, would have been an incredibly large piece of, um, of uh, uh, furniture. Um, there is a whole set of concerns around replacing the handles, replacing the hinges, designing them to be lightweight, designing them to be, uh, uh, to have corners that were resistant. And I just remember um, the traveling trunk from my own grandparents that I grew up with in my basement and how all the corners were brass 
and the hinges were, and it was lightweight, except for all the places where it could be damaged were uh, extra reinforced. And so just like cinema, um, something that also only occurred to me yesterday, preparing for today, just like cinema, just like all of the spectacular inventions, trunks too, are modern trunks, are 20th century trunks. Um, there's a whole discourse of um, catering to the woman to pack her own trunk and not needing help to pack her trunk. And um, a, a better trunk is a trunk that a woman can pack herself. Uh, and a more modern trunk is a trunk um, that the female traveler can uh, pack herself. So all the discourse around cinema and gender, cinema and modernity, uh, cinema and reinvention, um, that also applies to your trunks. Um, news to me. Um, if I can take uh, just a few more minutes and um, share with you um, some new thoughts from the week. Um, the Powers camera graph, those of you who got the full tour of the collection in the archives itself, the Powers camera graph is a spectacular piece from the LeMay collection. Um, it's the version in the collection is from 1916. Um, and the question is, how is it carried? Um, and just one example here I found uh, for sale online, uh, another 1916 camera graph um, that uh, the crankshaft comes with the original box. So you can imagine, you can just imagine, that there would be a special case for the lens and a special case for the crankshaft, and the fireproof magazine canisters would all come apart, and the lamp house would come apart, and everything would all fit in their own boxes um, into a carrying case, a specially made carrying case. Um, the camera graph uh, is uh, especially known. Uh, Nicholas Powers opened one of the first film exchanges in New York in 1899, um, but the camera graph uh, as a projector maker uh, begins in 1904, and Powers specialization after um, working for five years as a film exchange uh, representative is that he really um, patented the uh, fireproof magazine, the fireproof um, canister, which became a standard um, material, and that 1916 projector um, is ex almost exactly the same as the 1904 uh, original in design. Um, again, the kinetoscopes and the camera graphs, um, when you go back and look at the classified ads, they have cases, they come with cases. Um, I was talking with Anne about um, finding a few more examples, even just a few more examples of the original cases. She knows of a couple in Paris. She's going to photograph for me. Um, and the other perplexing thing in the archive is the Frankenstein monster of the projectoscope. Um, and exactly um, what date is it? Exactly what pieces is it? Everyone, I, I spent the day on my own on Monday um, in the collection itself. And as everyone would come through, everyone would stop at the projectoscope and say, oh, what's that? How did that come to be? Um, and indeed, all of the pieces um, from the projectoscope um, seem to be mixed and matched uh, for some reason. Um, the, uh, this phrase, the improved exhibiting model, in the advertising would uh, date it at 1908, not 1903, at least in the advertising. I don't know about that for sure. Um, and just to illustrate why it might be a Frankenstein monster of uh, bits and pieces all put together, here is a 1906 ad from Swab in Philadelphia, who had been working with Lubin. Um, so this is a 1906 ad. Notice to those contemplate running a store show, we will supply a brand new Edison machine with a Powers original upper fireproof magazine and with Swab's lower magazine drum. 
So definitely people were buying and making and selling uh, mix and match parts to create whatever type of projector you wanted. Uh, and each of the pieces could be purchased separately. And ju here's just one example from Swab, um, selling some Powers pieces with uh, Edison um, machine. Uh, some conclusions today, for what it's worth. Um, I'm now convinced that although it's cumbersome to move your projector, the weight and carriage of the projector was only as difficult and maybe even less difficult and only as expensive, maybe even less expensive, as any performer having to ship their theatrical wardrobe and their theatrical drunk, uh, trunk. Uh, they were probably drunk too. Um, the, the roster of one of those interstate traveling shows would have had several fewer performers. So it would have had several less performers than a similar live act show on the same circuit. So um, even the burden of having to ship the projector would have been savings compared to having even one theatrical act um, to, uh, needing to replace the projector. And of course, when you finally have a show that's only a singer, a piano player, a drummer, and the projectionist, um, you know, that, that is less performers than a dog and pony show. Um, so I wanna say thanks for everyone's input the last few days, um, and uh, just one last thing inspired by Ian, um, Ian's opening talk on Robert Paul. You know, the, um, the materiality of the machines and the invention is, I've come to understand this week, inseparable from the innovation of the business in general and the uh, uh, other forms of innovation that are happening. And just an example of something that I discovered in writing up my results about the early film exchange, um, this is Charles Oxenham and J.A. Leroy who opened the actual first film exchange in 1898 uh, in Brooklyn, um, and the first ones to use that phrase, film exchange, as the phrase that describes the business they're doing. Um, but in 1928, shortly after Terry Ramsey ignored them and wrote them out of his film history, um, the American projectionist begins recovering the history of the apparatus and begins recovering the history of early inventors. And in 1928, they are featured as pioneer exhibitors from 1895 with no mention of what I knew them for, which is their invention of the idea of the film exchange afterwards. Um, so just wanted to share this one little bit. Um, thank you, Marjolaine, for sharing the panel and everyone. Au lieu de Q&A, donc la période des questions, on a du temps. Peut-être d'abord, Paul, uh, je crois que, uh, I think you, you must talk to uh, Charles-André Coder, who is uh, currently processing the films that we shot. Uh, Chandra is leaving on tour with uh, Radwan Mumne and Jerusalem in my heart next week in Europe. It, that, that involves uh, carrying at least, at the very least, four <laughs> projectors. So, yeah, it's still going on a century later, those yeah. traveling exhibitors, day-to-day uh, -day, uh, shows and a new city every day. Donc, uh, question. Question pour Paul ou Marjane François. Thank you very much, Paul, for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation about uh, the carrying and the trunk. Um, he has so probably some secret on the collection of, of, of the, because it's a very, it's the nicest uh, trunk you don't see. <laughs> it's a very, it's a Kodascope library Model C with uh, did you see this? did you see it no no oh. uh, it is in original uh, it's a cabinet maker uh, walnut uh, box with a beautiful Art Deco shape and is original cardboard box from Kodak brand new 
is oh, there. Oh, is that the one in the cardboard box that's upside yes. down? In, okay, and yes. You, you don't, you don't I, open I, it. I, it's a secret that I opened it and looked at it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was beautiful. Yes, that's, was, yes. yes. So even that, the original cardboard. Yes. Really. You see the okay. box, Kodak, expedition from Kodak. Yes. Exactly. Uh, just another uh, um, precision. The peacock, uh, petit bone. Um, it's a bit historical uh, things. The the carousel where the image are from the frame are in aluminium cast aluminium and the patent was just six months before 1888 i don't know the number of the patent mm -hmm. so that because petty bone was working for military or suppose they have uh, access to the aluminium was extremely rare and probably extremely expensive at that time a uh, question for Paul, thanks to both of you. Uh, I thought I knew much stuff about traveling shows, but <laughs> you always <laughs> push me out of my chair. So you say there were about 200 itinerant shows, but uh, you, so w what is your main source for this inventory? Newspapers? And Thousands of newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thousands of. Yes, same. The, um, well, I have I have looked through the trade press and newspapers, and every month there are a few new newspapers. Um, and as we've talked about several times, um, I am convinced that. Um, if there was a show in town, it got at least a sentence in the newspaper. Yeah. Um, the only sh the only times I don't see news like I don't see a notice in the newspaper is um, when you get to a village um, when you get to a village that doesn't even have a newspaper. So. Um, it, it takes, um, but then there are other areas like upstate New York especially um, and uh, Canton de l'Est where um, all of the villages all have a weekly column in the, in the city paper and the, the shows are, it's, pr it's pretty predictable when you start mapping them and you know where the gaps are. So. I, 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 every time I count, I keep counting more, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have a comment that might add to what, you know, it's uh, long after the Nickelodeon uh, pulled out the, uh, the itinerants or part of them, um, some kinds of uh, traveling trunks without, without showmen uh, were, were put on, like, uh, uh, starting about 1920, McGill University had a, a system of uh, renting of uh, slides and lanterns. And uh, they had very big and uh, hard boxes to, to have the slides and projectors travel. Mm -hmm. And they didn't come to McGill and go to another place, come to McGill and go. They sent it to a place, and if there was a customer asking for it uh, three days later in another town, the guy who used it had the address, and he, he pushed it to the other town by the train. Mm -hmm. And uh, at McCord Museum, I, I have seen many of these boxes with the, the left tickets hold uh, stick to it with the, cus the customer who used it and the new, s the new, uh, the new label to the one who, uh, who uh, had it uh, at last. Uh, it's amazing how, uh, and uh, w one of the, one of the, how should I say, serial lectures that I've seen was called uh, the great movement, the great, the great movement forward in these certain townships, uh, fall of 1919 and winter of 1920. There are about 50 uh, small villages that succeed in receiving a uh, a lecture about the missions, the Protestant Canadian missions mm -hmm. in the Northwest, uh, Labrador, China, India, Africa, to raise money. So they had a series of, 
of uh, slides to show the, the work, uh, constructing schools, uh, churches, uh, raising, educating uh, these poor people that don't know about Christian culture. <laughs> but this probably it was the same set of slides that traveled from one village to the other. And every, uh, every week or every two or three days, a different ad appear with the name of the uh, priest that will give the lecture in each village. It's amazing. Um, I, as a researcher, obviously there's digression all the time, right? You might follow us, right? I'm wondering, um, about eight or nine years ago, I was in Berlin, and a fellow had a company called Nomad and Kino, and he had two 35-millimeter projectors that he had secured from East Germany, and he set them up on tripods, and he would travel around and show your film. And uh, so he showed my film, he came in, took him a couple hours, he lived in his van, he lived in a van, and he had his equipment with him, and he would set up and project. And he was traveling around all of Ger Germany. He didn't have films, but he would project open-air screenings. So I'm wondering if in that thread, if you found that, I'm pretty sure he's not enigmatic in that way. Have you found that there's a little bit of a culture of that still happening? Still happening. Um, well, the the... The more recent ones I know about are uh, European colleagues who, especially around the centenary of cinema, um, did uh, remount like crazy cinematograph and and remountings of um, early cinema periods. So, but I mean, what comes to mind for me is the Wakiponi media, mobile media in in northern Quebec and efforts to thinking of Germain's point um, that are historically related to university extension programs and, and different types of things like that. So um, it's, it's certainly not something that's ever gone away. Um, and, but the, for me, the, the kind of end point of um, my interest, um, because I am studying main uh, like commercial distribution, so the endpoint for me is um, when a, a, a rental option allows the nickel show to open. So, like my personal interest is in Hollywood distribution and its um, origins or its its precedents. So. But if I, if I were m more interested in mobile media and mobile cinema, I, I am, and micro cinemas, like, the, yes, this happens. Um, the Toronto Outdoor Picture Show was just fundraising by selling community bonds uh, to purchase their own inflatable screen um, because the one person who owns one of those in Toronto has a monopoly on it, and they want to undercut him by by having a competition. So it's even you know, there there are mobile drive-ins, there are you know all all sorts of um, activist, avant-garde artist, but also just summer fun kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this question is directed to Paul. In your research, have you come across any preference, I'm making an assumption here, that it would have been oxyacetylene over electricity? And have you come across any tales? You've probably read the Richardson Projection Manual where they're talking about if you may, if there's no electricity, you can hook into the trolley lines and I'm thinking, <laughs> or make a resistance out of a, a barrel of water, and I'm just thinking of people, you know, getting electrocuted. <laughs> I, I was saying with um, uh, Kelly on the way to lunch, um, the, the 
couple of shows that we have extensive archives of um, are um, they specialize in particularly small towns um, and nightly change. Um, so they order their own gas, so they, and they order it um, as part of their disposable dis supplies. They have one supplier who ships it in advance, like I said. Um, so I think the smaller the towns you're um, focusing on and the more mobile you are, the m I'm estimating from the little bit I know. But I think if you need to be more mobile and you need to change more often, then your preference is for gas uh, because you can't rely on, you really don't know what's going to happen when you arrive. Um, but I, and I, I don't know if, if Nichols shows always ran on the power, the municipal power supply or if some of them use gas. I actually don't know. So it's a good question. Merci à nos conférenciers. Merci.